In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Tonight on Prime Time, waiting on a delivery that feels like it may never come. Many are saying that it's taken weeks to get their packages just from Nashville to Atlanta. Many emails we have received. Many frustrated people were looking into the causes of the problem tonight. A basketball scholarship at Morehouse and a young man is fulfilling his dream and his potential. He wants to serve in the Navy and attend an HBCU. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. On this Tuesday night, people in Louisiana and Texas bracing for what could be a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Laura is getting stronger. Some counties already under a mandatory evacu uh, evacuation order. Meanwhile, the rain has been coming down for us in Metro Atlanta, thanks to how active it is out in the Gulf of Mexico right now. This video sent to us from Canton. Meteorologist Samantha Moore tracking all of it for us. What's the very latest, Samantha? Well, as of the 8 o'clock advisory, 435 miles away from Lake Charles, Louisiana, so southeast of Lake Charles, Louisiana, and strengthening as Laura moves over the Gulf. Now, currently a Cat 1 hurricane, but in the next few hours, in the early morning hours, likely to become a Category 2, so strengthening with those winds up around 100 miles per hour by 2 o'clock in the morning, and then continuing to strengthen as it heads towards the coastline. And the thing is, the waters are very warm here. There's very little shear. The environment is rich for hurricane growth, and it could easily be a Cat 3, if not stronger, as it approaches the coastline, and then it'll continue that track to the north, bringing in a lot of heavy rain. Storm surge is going to be incredible with this one as well, and then it's going to curve around an area of high pressure to our north. So right now, we are not in that cone. We were for a while yesterday, uh, the cone of the tropical depression, as it would be at that point. But it's going to continue to move up and over that ridge. And I think it'll drag some moisture in here come Friday night and Saturday. So we have a pretty good chance to see some showers and storms enhanced by some of this tropical moisture, similar to what we had today. And that was just Marco, a tropical storm. We could get some of this tropical moisture in here on Saturday. And that could enhance some of our rainfall as we head into the weekend. Interesting thing, I was looking at the shear today, and it looks like the shear over this area is weakening. So that is one of the reasons why as this hurricane approaches the coast late tomorrow night into early Thursday, it will likely strengthen very, very quickly since there is just nothing here to dismantle it. Like Marco had a lot of shear and that drug the thunderstorms over into the panhandle and into South Georgia. That shear is not going to be present as Laura approaches the coast, so that'll give it ample 
opportunity to rapidly intensify, and that is going to be the worst case scenario for the folks along the Texas Louisiana line. Coming up, we'll talk more about how much rain we could get as we head through the rest of this week and into the weekend. You can use the 11 Alive app to help you stay ahead of the weather. You'll find interactive maps and radar to help you track rain and storms no matter where you may be. A man armed with a hammer arrested after stealing a MARTA bus this afternoon. MARTA police say the suspect used the hammer to hit the handrail, causing the driver to pull over at Joseph E. Boone Boulevard and Troy Street. The driver let the passengers get out. The suspect drove the bus to the North Avenue bus loop where he was arrested. Another bus was sent to pick up the driver and the passengers. Two arrests have been made in the murder of an 83-year-old woman. Barbara Gibson was murdered in her Carroll County home in May. The sheriff's office is holding a news conference tomorrow morning to release more information. If you're waiting on a FedEx delivery that's now a few days late, even longer, you're not alone. A number of 11 Alive viewers have been complaining about FedEx, saying they're just not getting their packages, the ones that come through the company's Norcross facility. Joe Hankey looked into that issue today. My package was delayed by over a week. And it only came from Nashville, from Nashville to Atlanta. David Hagen received his package Friday after spending part of the day waiting and working remotely in FedEx's Norcross facility parking lot. Um, for about three hours on Friday until I finally was able to get somebody who could, uh, could you know, confirm that the package was there and I was able to finally get the package. Hagen's tracking updates show his package arrived in Norcross on August 15th, went out for delivery on the 18th, then back to Norcross, and he was then told Friday without his request, he had 10 business days to pick up his package. Hagen says calls to FedEx during the week led to no further details. During a pandemic, he would prefer to shop online, but is now thinking twice. Now I'm forced to go into a store that I might not otherwise go into um, because I can't count on, I can't count on shipping. I talked to the shipper and they reshipped the item and now that is lost somewhere. Abby Sand says an online purchase shipped through FedEx on July 22nd never arrived. The company shipped a replacement with FedEx on August 11th. Tracking records show her item arrived in Kennesaw on the 13th. FedEx's Norcross facility on the 14th stayed in Norcross all last week and then headed back to Kennesaw. Sands is still waiting, and she says her neighbors are too. There's a whole bunch of postings on next door, probably about 100 of them. Uh, I, I know it's not just me. A FedEx spokesman tells 11 Alive in the company's most recent quarter, ending May 31st, FedEx ground shipping jumped 25% compared to 2019. A FedEx statement reads in part, FedEx ground is experiencing a surge of package volume due to e-commerce growth during the current pandemic that has resulted in a temporary service delay for some packages in the Norcross area. Joe, did FedEx give any specific reason for the delay in those packages that went through the Norcross facility? Well, Cheryl, I asked the company spokeswoman today if there's anything unique about the facility in Norcross that is creating delays there. The company did not directly answer that question, but I was told that they are putting additional delivery resources in place to hopefully deal with any delays customers are currently experiencing. The number of deaths related to COVID shot up again. The Department of Public Health saying 106 people have died with the virus. One of those deaths, a 14-year-old girl from Habersham County. She is listed as having chronic conditions, the deputy coroner who performed the autopsy says she was at Eggleston for a number of days before dying due to septic shock caused by COVID-19. The Habersham County coroner says her underlying health issues did not contribute to her death. She is the fourth child under the age of 18 to die from the virus in the state. So we understand that she had health problems, but apparently it did not contribute to her death, okay? While the number of new cases continue to decrease, the White House Coronavirus Task Force says Georgia is not yet out of the red. According to the report obtained by the Center for Public Integrity, Georgia still has the second highest rate of infection in the country. Last week, we had 167 new infections for every 100,000 residents. That's compared to the national average of 93. The task force is also urging people to be wearing masks and is also calling for more aggressive testing in long-term care facilities. It is the ongoing debate happening in homes all across Metro Atlanta. Is it safe for students in the classroom? The Education Secretary Betsy DeVos was in Forsyth County to talk about reopening plans where parents have a choice between in-person or digital learning. She's been in support of getting students back in the classroom in the pandemic. But as 11 Alive's Latasha Givens, not everybody agrees with that and everybody wants to speak out about it as well.
Secretary DeVos was welcome with open arms to the Forsyth County School District. She even checked on a few teachers and classrooms while she was here, but she was also met with opposition from a former school nurse who insists in person learning should not be happening in Georgia right now. The Forsyth County School District sent us these video clips of Secretary Betsy DeVos's arrival. DeVos led a roundtable discussion with educators and parents. The secretary has been a major voice in support of school having in-person learning. One option Forsyth County Schools has in place, coupled with the option for virtual coursework. While these talks were taking place in Forsyth, there were other discussions happening in other counties around the state. I really don't think she has a right to even be here, considering that she was part um, of the problem. Uh, she was in agreement with the opening of schools. A strong rebuke from Amy back. Westmoreland, a mother and former school nurse in Paulding County. So, as a nurse, do you believe it's safe to return to school right now in Georgia? No, absolutely not. Westmoreland says she resigned as a school nurse because she was concerned about student and staff safety. She even referenced these now infamous pictures of crowded hallways during the first week of school. When they decided to open schools back up, um, you know, it was just horrifying to me. And then, you know, those pictures circulated um, and it kind of confirmed my my worst fears in terms of seeing those children so close to one another. But DeVos insists the best place for students right now is in the classroom, like the one she visited at Forsyth Central High School. Thursday's COVID-19 numbers released by the Department of Health shows Forsyth County had 70 new cases today, the second highest on record. And to put that into perspective, the seven day average is about 35 cases a day. The November election now 10 weeks away, 70 days. Georgia plans to roll out another voting option next week. It is an online site where voters can request an absentee ballot without having to print and sign and send in the request. Here's Doug Richards to take a closer look. A few days ago, my wife and I got in the U.S. mail a paper absentee ballot application. Filling one of these out and then returning it to the county election office has been pretty much the only way to get an actual absentee ballot in Georgia. That's going to change next week. Absentee ballots were very, very popular in the June primary. As people who voted in person sometimes found themselves waiting in uncomfortably long lines during a dangerous pandemic. To make it easier to get an absentee ballot, Georgia's Secretary of State is creating an online portal that will look something like this. You click the request button, then you enter your county, your name, and other personal info, and it takes you to a spot where you can get a ballot without signing anything. All you really need is your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your driver's license or state ID number, and your county. From those five pieces of information, the system will identify you as an individual voter and then it'll let you into the actual request section of the portal. The result is an absentee ballot mailed to you. You can drop in a box in some counties or mail in to vote in November's election. In so doing, the Republican Secretary of State is trying to sidestep a rising controversy over mail-in voting, led by the Republican president. We have to be very careful because they're trying it again with this whole 80 million mail-in ballots that they're working on and mocked by Democrats. Who is signing them? Who's signing them? What, are they signed at a kitchen table and sent in? Who's signing them? The voter has to sign them. You got to sign your actual ballot so we know it's you actually voted. And that's the signature that election workers will try to match with the signature that they have on file when the voter registered. The Secretary of State's office will let voters track their absentee ballots online to see if they are accepted or rejected. Absentee balloting cannot begin legally until the end of September. It's night two of the Republican National Convention and headlining tonight, First Lady Melania Trump with the White House as the backdrop. President Trump's children, Eric and Tiffany, will deliver remarks along with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The administration says Secretary Pompeo is speaking as a private citizen and that no taxpayer dollars will be funding his address. In the next half hour, we're going to fact check claims that some of the night's biggest speeches, including a Georgia Democrat who crossed party lines for the big event. Virtual learning and separation from friends during the pandemic, it does not come easy for kids. Next, how a pediatric nurse is hoping to help children cope through a very tough stretch in their lives. Don't forget, we're streaming right now, the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe, join in on the conversation. 
We have more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. We're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Parents across the country struggling to help their children understand and cope with COVID-19. Many of them are in school virtually, away from their friends and extended family. A pediatric nurse in Atlanta saw how difficult it is for children and decided to try and do something about it. Caitlin Ross reports she launched Hearts Connected to try and support children during an uncertain time. Dee Dee Fritch has sat at the bedside of sick kids for years as a pediatric nurse. She saw firsthand the difference a child life specialist could have in the lives of kids who were really struggling. Now that so many children are having a hard time with the COVID-19 pandemic, she wanted to bring that service directly to the families who need it. As adults, we struggle, right? Like, I miss my friends, you know? I want to go hug people. Dee Dee Fritch knows the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on everyone, but she says it's even more difficult for kids who don't fully understand what's going on. Playing on a computer is very different than playing in a neighborhood or playing in the grass or playing with your friends. The only way some kids can see their friends now is over a screen. We've heard for so many years about screen time. You know, you limit screen time. Well, what the heck does that mean these days? She says the isolation has been confusing and difficult for kids and their caregivers. And we have parents, grandparents, caregivers, trying to juggle. For 30 years as a pediatric nurse, she saw the benefit of child life specialists in hospitals. They helped families cope with difficult diagnoses, medical changes, or difficult life transitions. You think of a child going through a funeral service, divorce, adoption, foster care, um, imprisonment. She says that service was so essential. She wanted all families to have access to it, not just families with a child in the hospital. I've learned through my career what is some of the best ways to manage pediatric coping. But when my child is facing that, I can't say I've always done it the right way. She just launched Friday, but offers sessions with child life specialists over the phone or by video chat. She says no matter what service people use, the most important thing is that children struggling during this time are heard. Find the best way to relate to your child in a place where they feel safe and ask them open-ended questions. You can find her new company, Hearts Connected, on Facebook. And while they're based here in Atlanta, they're helping care for children all over the U.S. For your 11 Alive storm trackers, busy today tracking all the rain that moved in. Some one to three inches with some spots getting even four inches of rainfall. And as we take a look out over at 75, 285, back towards the city, you can barely, you can barely see it. We have a nice layer of low cloudiness and some fog forming here. So just be aware when you're out and about tonight, you might run into some dense 
areas of fog that have formed as a result of all the rain that we saw. Now, this was taken at Panama City Beach by one of our 11 Alive storm trackers last night, Scott Kuhn, as all those severe thunderstorms came rolling on in. What an incredible shot he got of that cloud to ground or cloud to gulf lightning strike there as it hit the water and those storms came rolling in. The surf looks pretty choppy, at least for Panama City Beach, because it's usually very calm there. So uh, Donna Foster, she was talking about how much rain she picked up today out of these storms in West Cobb. She picked up over four inches of rainfall. A lot of our storm trackers are more, uh, reporting full rain gauges after all the waves of rain that we had today. So this is our water vapor satellite imagery and it shows that moisture moving in all across North Georgia throughout the day today. And that was really what was left of Marco. But uh, the door has been opened to the the tropics and we have a lot of moisture out there that's going to be pulled in here the next few days so that could just give us some heavier downpours at times as we head in through especially the afternoon and evening hours the next couple of days and then possibly throughout the day on Saturday so right now things finally tapering off here things looking much much better on the radar showing you the few showers in Carrollton here in Carroll County stretching over towards Douglasville and then we have a few little leftover showers just south of Athens towards El and into Madison. But other than that, things have really quieted down from what we had throughout much of the day here. And we'll likely see things pretty quiet overnight, but we will have that area of low clouds and fog forming, so just be aware of that. Okay, so there is Laura chugging across the very warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. It's strengthening, it's showing more and more convection as it cycles around 435 miles away from Lake Charles right now, southeast of Lake Charles and moving northwest at 17 miles per hour, expected to strengthen in the next few hours to a Cat 2 already. And then a Cat 3 possibly upon landfall or even maybe a little stronger. This is the shear that you can see here on this map. And basically there's an open door uh, to Lake Charles, Louisiana. There's not the shear that we had from Marco that ripped it apart and sent all the thunderstorms into Florida. We're not going to see that. Uh, with Laura. There's just not going to be much shear around at all. So we have warnings in place along the Texas and Louisiana coast. Those are hurricane warnings. We also have storm surge warnings in place as well, 9 to 13 feet along the coast. And this storm surge could go as far as 30 miles inland. Just incredible. So uh, hopefully those folks are battening down the hatches here. We have the storm that's going to be moving into Texas and Louisiana. And then it's going to curve around it here as we head on in to the um, week weekend for us. So that'll pull in a little extra moisture and that could fuel some more of our showers and storms as we head in through the weekend. Now most of the heaviest rain will be right along the track itself, but we could easily see an inch, inch and a half, maybe even two inches in some of these spots. We picked up an inch in 1900s today and our temperatures were only three degrees apart from our low to our high. 73 are low. Six are high. This evening we'll see a slight chance for a few little leftover showers. Temperatures not cooling off much. We're already in the 70s, so we'll be around 72 degrees. A seven on the wasometer on our Wednesday, and that's a 30% chance of showers and storms during the day. So temperatures will get up into the mid to upper 80s around North Georgia. So today's rain is tapering off with some scattered showers and storms, and we'll be watching for that increased moisture from Laura to move in as we head in towards the weekend. So a 30% chance tomorrow, 20% chance on Thursday, 40% chance Friday, rain increasing late in the day, and it looks like Saturday will be the wettest day of the weekend. A young basketball star, one step closer to another goal, becoming an officer in the Navy. His name is Brock Davis. He's a really good high school basketball player in Oklahoma, and now he is going to continue his playing career at Morehouse while fulfilling his dream of attending an HBCU, and the ROTC is helping him do it, a $180,000 scholarship in his name. I think that's just a step in the right direction. I think I'm just, it just makes me more excited to come here and just continue doing what I started in high school, just doing right by the community and serving my country. He was selected from among thousands of applicants around the country. The young man wants to become an officer in the Navy. As for his goals in basketball, he just wants to see how it goes. Coming up, how one Georgia 12-year-old used her creativity to deal with the emotional and physical toll of coronavirus. Coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, 
extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. More than 18,000 school-aged children in Georgia have now tested positive for the virus since the pandemic began. And while there's been a lot of talk about COVID in the classroom, Veal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom found staying at home also comes with some inherent risk. The CDC wanted to know more about how this virus was spreading among family members. It found that in more than half of the houses studied, multiple people got sick. That's even after the infected person slept in another room, used a different bathroom, and wore a mask around the house. Now, men were more likely to spread the virus than women, but adults were more likely to give it to their children than to their spouse. 12-year-old Anaya Davis says she doesn't need a study to know any of that. I felt like there was just pain and poking at my head. Someone was like, poke, 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 poke. If you've never had COVID, Anaya Davis says this is what it feels like. I felt like COVID was in my lungs and it hurt. And that scared me. From her head to her lungs to her stomach. She drew her emotions, you know, she felt this COVID, that the pain that she had and what she felt, she drew it. She wished for a superhero. So he's doing this type of Spider-Man pose, shooting um, hand sanitizer out onto the street. But it didn't work fast enough. The virus went from her dad to her mom. Anaya's symptoms are way worse than mine. She had every symptom, like the no smell, no taste, the stomach ache, the chills. She had everything. And in her self-isolation came loneliness. You know, I missed my sister. I missed her a lot. So it, this it one lonely. is, are you reaching for someone? Because and the raindrops represent how, the, um, give it the sad vibe. Yeah, I was definitely reaching out. Were you ever scared? Yeah, sometimes. But a candid note from her sister did something Spider-Man couldn't. You may not be the best sister, you can be mean sometimes, but I still love you and you need to get better. And then the next day, how I was, I was better. A 10 day fight worth fighting. A victory over the virus. Be the boxer, keep your head up. They get punched so many times, but they keep fighting. And the person who has COVID, or the person who needs to hear this thing to keep fighting, because I know they can get through it. There is a new historical marker in coming that is a reminder of a moment that started a racial cleansing of Forsyth County a long time ago. Next, how one of the now wealthiest counties in Georgia is coming to face 
with its difficult and racist past. A symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. A historical marker on the courthouse square in Cumming will soon remind people of a 1912 lynching of a man named Rob Edwards, an African-American man. It was the beginning of a racial cleansing that resulted in the expulsion of more than 1,000 African-American residents in Forsyth County. Brendan Keith shows you how this county, which is now prospering greatly in 2020 in Georgia, has a much different past than many might believe. It is hidden in a narrow patch of forest between rows of half million dollar homes. Even looking straight down, nothing betrays the mystery of what lies beneath. These tombstones are all that's left of the old Black Baptist Church at Stony Point. Look closely at the dates. Why do they all end before 1912? This is not evidence of promises broken, but of loved ones kept away, because the men, women, and children buried here were the only black residents of Forsyth County, Georgia, for nearly all of the 20th century. All of the Negro people had to leave. There was knocking on the door, and they were told to get out. Elon Osby heard the story directly from her own mother, Willie Mae Bagley, just a two-year-old back in 1912 when the Knight Riders came to their home and so many others in Forsyth County. Can you imagine the fear that they would have felt? William and Ida Bagley paid taxes on 60 acres they owned in 1912. We could find no record of any sale in the county courthouse except those of white men later selling parcels of the Bagley's land to one another. 
The 1910 census showed the Bagleys among 1,098 black residents of the county, a tenth of the total population. By 1920, nearly every last one of them was gone. There are these long stretches where decade after decade, the black population of Forsyth County is zero. Historical photos show only white faces after 1912. So what happened that year? Thousands turned out to celebrate the public hanging of two black teenagers convicted in a single day by an all-white jury of raping and murdering a white girl named May Crow. The other black suspect had already been lynched right here on the coming courthouse square. The lynching of Rob Edwards involved a very large crowd gathering outside the jail, dragging him out of the jail, beating him with crowbars, dragging his body around town behind a wagon, and then eventually his, his corpse is hoisted to, uh, you know, on a telegraph pole and everyone in the crowd takes turns shooting into his body. Time has not stopped at the cemetery where May Crow is buried next to a Confederate soldier. The headstones here continue through the 20th century, unlike the black graveyard at Stony Point. White people felt we had no value, not in life and not in death. Civil rights leader Hosea Williams and other activists marched twice in Forsyth County in January of 1987. They were met with fierce resistance, which locals blamed on outside agitators. The phrase racial cleansing is offensive to them. Shouldn't it be? I, I don't know how they can say it's offensive to them. What, what do you think it was to us? Back in 1912, whites also blamed outsiders as papers across the nation documented the campaign of terror that led to the expulsion of the entire black population. But we don't know how the local paper covered it because this is the only known surviving edition of the Forsyth County News from all of 1912. It features an article praising the public executions. Most of the Forsyth County News has been microfilmed, digitized, you can access it online. Mm -hmm. But 1912, all but one issue, one edition, has been erased, it's vanished. What's the importance of making sure this history isn't erased? So that it doesn't happen again. Just across from the spot where Rob Edwards was lynched, Lady Justice faces history wearing her blindfold. But soil from the square has been collected in a jar, and the name Rob Edwards will soon join the lynching memorial at the Equal Justice Initiative. The Community Remembrance Project of Forsyth County really got this rolling and worked with the Equal Justice Initiative. So they're going to put up a marker that will memorialize Rob Edwards and tell the story of, of that lynching. And that's going to be on the spot where he was lynched, which is, which is you know something I never thought I would live to see. This with the marker is a first step. There are already several hidden markers to the black community that once thrived here, now surrounded by new neighborhoods that are increasingly diverse. Some of those new residents are buying homes here on the land Elon's grandparents once owned. The old Bagley place is now among the most valuable real estate in Metro Atlanta. Brendan Keefe will have a more of an in-depth examination of the Forsyth County story as part of an 11 Alive primetime special, Equality Matters, examining social justice and racial inequalities tomorrow night on 11 Alive. Well, we're continuing to watch the strengthening of Hurricane Laura as it moves across the Gulf of Mexico. You can see here in the satellite imagery that Laura is becoming much more uh, organized and is expanding as well. So Laura is going to be a fairly large storm moving to the northwest at 17 miles per hour, now a little over 430 miles away from Lake Charles and moving in their direction. So we're expecting to see Laura strengthen to a Category 2 hurricane within the next few hours. It's possible even by the 11 o'clock advisory, uh, Laura could be up to a cat too. But if not, in the early morning hours, it's very likely. And then approaching the coast late tomorrow, early Thursday, and there's not much shear right here near the coastline. So we expect to see rapid intensification take place unfortunately, uh, right before landfall. And if you remember Michael, when it came in um, to Mexico Beach in Florida, 
uh, what was that, two years ago now? It strengthened very similarly. It strengthened right before it hit the coast, and it ended up being a Category 5. Um, and so it kind of well outperformed what the models were indicating. And then it's going to move over a ridge of high pressure far to our north. Now, this time yesterday, we were in this cone of this tropical depression or this area of low pressure. But now it's going to be a little further to the north, at least as the models are trending. It's going to be further to our north. So we're less likely to see organized storms move in. But a little of that tropical moisture, or maybe a lot, could be pulled in as we head into Friday night and Saturday. Saturday, and that could enhance our storms here across North Georgia. So some of the main points for Laura, those warm waters and the weak shear are likely to be the best environment or a really um, healthy environment for hurricane growth. So that's why we're expecting rapid intensification, strengthening to a major hurricane. So that's a cat three or higher. And we'll likely see some of that moisture kind of moved across North Georgia as we head into the end of the week and the weekend. And that could mean some heavier rain once again, similar to what we had today. And we'll have more forecast details for your weekend coming up in just a few minutes. All right. A neighborhood is coming together to keep their local businesses open during COVID-19 and the pandemic. Here's Tracy A. McPeer to show us how. This is devastating businesses, and it's devastating businesses that are in all our neighborhoods. After the pandemic hit, and Eric O'Brien saw stores and restaurants in his neighborhood suffering, he says he wanted to do something to help. So in May, he launched the Good Morning Side sign project. We did 25 signs, and those sold out in like a day. And like, okay, now 50 signs. And that's when I knew there was there, there could be some momentum. Here's how it works. The signs sell for $25. Then 100% of that money is pooled together to buy $100 gift certificates from local businesses. Everything from a frame store and jeweler to a chiropractor and learning center. Morningside restaurants are also getting a boost, like NOACs. Owner Blaze Nowak says this project has helped keep them going. If we don't have the support and all the other stores don't have the support, a lot of people are out of business. I think we're still going to see a lot of people um, out of business. And O'Brien says it doesn't stop there. Then I take those gift certificates and I give them to the Morningside PTA and they're going to auction off those gift certificates. And that money stays at the local public school. O'Brien calls it a win-win and a way as a community to work together for the common good. O'Brien says the Morningside project has been so successful that he's been contacted by other neighborhoods wanting to start one there. So far, it's taken off in Virginia Highlands, but their sign says Bahia. It benefits their local businesses and Springdale Park, their local public school. So far, the Morningside Project has sold more than 275 signs. If you're in that neighborhood at all, you will see them everywhere, and they have raised more than $3,000. The RNC in full swing, full gear as usual. We have a lot of claims and fact checking to the speeches each night. Up next, we're checking one from a Georgia state lawmaker. The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect. Speakers at the RNC last night made plenty of claims and our Verify team checked to fact check each and every one of them, including one from Vernon Jones. Here is our Jason Puckett with a breakdown. Let's start with the claim from Georgia Democrat and Trump supporter Vernon Jones. The president also built the most inclusive economy ever with record low unemployment for African Americans and record high participation in the workforce. Let's start with the unemployment claim. Federal Reserve economic data does show that African American unemployment did hit an all time low of 5.4% in late 2019. That is the lowest in recorded history. That part of the claim is verified. But the claim that African American workforce participation is at an all time high, that part's false. The same data shows that African American workforce participation was at its highest in 1999. That was about 66 percent. And in late 2019, it was about 63 percent. Next, a claim from Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise. The left wants to defund the police. Joe Biden has embraced the left's insane mission to defund them. This claim is false. In an ABC interview on Sunday, Biden was asked directly if he wanted to defund the police. He answered, quote, no, I don't. Later adding that, quote, I think they need more help. They need more assistance. In June, Biden wrote an op-ed that was posted in the USA Today where he wrote, quote, I don't support defunding police. Next, a claim from South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. We actually saw revenues to the Treasury increase after we lowered taxes in 2017. That claim is true before you account for inflation. Data from the Congressional Budget Office shows that tax revenue has increased every single year since 2009, including in 2018 after that tax cut was passed. But according to the Brookings Institute, when you apply inflation, quote, revenue fell from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018. Folks, we got more claims from night one up on our website. If you see something you want us to take a look at, send us an email. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. Well, it's likely that we'll see some areas of fog across North Georgia as we head out and about tonight and tomorrow. We already saw some forming uh, across the city of Atlanta when the sun was up. Now the sun has set. So overnight, with all the moisture we had, we are bound to see some dense areas of radiation fog early in the morning. Uh, Jason Bonner and Hiawassee captured this earlier. Look at that. Just an incredible shot with all those bright pink colors and the green of the evergreens and then the white fog. Really nice job, Jason. Thank you for posting that on our 11 Alive Storm Tracker Facebook page. Lots of tropical moisture to be had out there, and a lot of that from Marco kind of got pulled across us. So that's why we had that drenching rain throughout today, even had some flash flood warnings for a while. But now things have really tapered off. It's quieting down. Just a few sprinkles out there in southeastern. 
uh, Carroll County and DeHerd County, Coweta County, and everything that was around the Athens area has dissipated. So we're getting a break now, and we'll see that fog forming with all that leftover moisture. But the tropics are indeed active, and we are seeing Laura strengthening, and uh, that trend is going to continue into the overnight hours, most likely. Now, these hurricanes, they cycle, so they tend to look more organized and then a little disorganized, and then they look more organized again. And right now, you can see the latest pictures here of Laura look pretty impressive here with almost a defined eye as far as that center of circulation. So right now, Laura is about 435 miles southeast of Lake Charles, moving to the northwest at 17. So moving at a pretty fast clip here, a Category 1 right now, but we are expecting it to strengthen as we head overnight. And the shear has weakened since yesterday when we had Marco we ended up seeing all that moisture pulled in by wind shear, and it was pulled over Florida and over Georgia. But there is not much shear out here as Laura approaches. And there's a little bit more right at landfall, but that's going to occur after Laura has passed, most likely. So, in other words, the door is open for rapid intensification for Laura as it, she approaches the coastline. And most likely we'll have winds well over 100 miles per hour, in fact, around 115 upon landfall. Storm surge will be some 9 to 13 feet along the coastline itself, and it could go in as far, extend in inland as much as 30 miles. So we're looking at it making landfall late tomorrow night into early Thursday. And then if you want to follow it around here, it's going to go around a ridge of high pressure, and it's going to be pretty far to our north now, further north than we thought as of this time yesterday. But it still has the potential to drag in tropical moisture here. So that could fuel some showers and storms late Friday into Saturday. Look at our temperatures today. This is crazy. We didn't warm up much at all. We were down around 73, and we made it to 76. Three degrees of warm today. We were at 78 in Rome, 79 in Athens, and in Eatonton, 78 in Peachtree City. So overnight tonight, you can expect to see temperatures not cool very much by a couple degrees, and we'll have a chance for a few isolated sprinkles or showers. No big deal. 30% chance on Wednesday, more typical in terms of heat of the day storms. And then as we head into our Thursday, uh, Wednesday, excuse me, we'll have that chance as we head in through the day as well. Just very light stuff and then maybe an isolated shower or two. So today's rain's tapering off. We'll have some scattered showers and storms uh, during the afternoon for our Wednesday, Thursday. And then getting into Friday, our rain chances go up to 40% chance, 50% chance in the evening hours, late evening, and then 60% chance on our Saturday. And we'll end up seeing things pretty active, I think, during the day on Saturday as a result of some of that tropical moisture being pulled in. And then we're back to the normal heat of the day pattern into the beginning of next week. Hello, everyone. I'm Maria Martin. Georgia State freshman quarterback Michaela Colasurdo is sidelined for the 2020 football season after developing a heart condition related to his positive COVID-19 test back in July. Today, he's speaking out in order to warn other athletes to take this virus very seriously so that the same doesn't happen for them. You're not immune from this. This can happen to you, too. Me being a 19-year-old athlete, you know, a, a healthier person, I'm not someone that's had a pre-existing condition. He was a state champion at Chapman High School in South Carolina, excited for his beginning with the Panthers. But even after finally testing negative for the virus, it was the test administered at Georgia State that alerted doctors something just wasn't right with Colasurdo's heart. That was kind of the whole scary thing is if, you know, I'm at home working out, I would have never known. His doctors have not yet pinpointed exactly what the condition is. We talked about, you know, myocarditis, which is the inflammation on the inside of the heart, pericarditis, which is kind of on the outside. The truth is we just don't 100% know what it is yet. They have, however, made a clear connection between COVID-19 and this heart condition. I've never had any heart issues or anything like that before. And when he learned he couldn't play football this year. Today I watched our team, our team practice, and that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, man, I'm really, really going to miss this when, when games start coming around. He's also under strict instruction to completely limit physical activity for now, but his doctors have confidence this won't turn into a larger issue down the line. He explained it as kind of a reactionary thing. This happened because I just got sick. It can happen with different types of infections. He thinks it's going to be a relatively short-term issue that should be able to be resolved. A Senate candidate texted Twitter after becoming the target of hackers during a virtual town hall. A breakdown of what happened and how Raphael Warnock of Ebenezer is moving forward.
Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Hackers interrupted a virtual town hall meeting with the Hall County Georgia Democratic Party last night. People in the meeting say that Senate candidate, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, was the target of racist attacks. Hackers chanted uh, the N-word, flashed porn uh, images as well. Reverend Warnock tweeted about the attack, saying a hateful few won't stop us from going everywhere and speaking to everyone. It is more important than ever to hear each other out, and that's what I will do in the Senate, end quote. The meeting is open to the public and advertised on the group's Facebook page and newsletter. The group says, moving forward, they will be putting additional security measures now in place. Ahead on prime time, an easier way to request an absentee ballot ahead of the November election. The state's plan, which is just a point and a click away. For coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. 
First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Governor of Wisconsin has declared a state of emergency and is increasing the National Guard presence in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after a second night of protests over the police shooting of Jacob Blake, and it became destructive. This, as Blake's family gives new details about the details uh, of his uh, injuries. Here's NBC's Wendy Woolfolk. Another smoldering city. This time, Kenosha, Wisconsin, as protesters clash with police and each other. I noticed a lot of damage. It doesn't reflect my son or my family. Mom, you have to get back. 29-year-old Jacob Blake was unarmed when he was shot in the back while struggling with police on Sunday, leaving him paralyzed from the waist down. It is going to take a miracle for Jacob Blake Jr. to ever walk again. Witness video posted online sparking outrage. They shot my son seven times. Seven times. Police releasing few details other than saying officers were responding to a domestic incident that involved a shooting. And the Justice Department has confirmed to NBC News that it will assist in the state investigation. <laughs> Residents scared for the safety of their homes and livelihoods. This is pathetic. This is pathetic for to happen in our country. A situation leaving an entire nation looking for change. Right now on prime time, thousands ordered to evacuate as Hurricane Laura approaches the Gulf Coast. Where this storm is now and what it can mean for us in Georgia. Viewers reaching out to 11 Alive with complaints about delivery delays from FedEx. We take your questions to the shipping giant. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First tonight, a new White House report shows improvements in Georgia's fight against COVID-19. But President Trump's federal task force says those improvements are quote, fragile. 11 Alive's Chenu Herb breaks down some key findings in the latest analysis. The good news for Georgia is the COVID-19 numbers in the state are decreasing, including new cases and test positivity. That's according to the latest report from the White House COVID-19 task force obtained by 11 Alive News. While there are clear signs of progress, the report says these improvements need to accelerate as Georgia is still second in the country when it comes to the spread of new cases. In a new statement, Governor Kemp's office cites declines in new cases, hospitalizations and the positivity rate as proof of improvement. But the governor acknowledges there's still work to do. These are encouraging signs but we can't take our foot off the gas. The White House task force says improvements remain fragile and again calls for a statewide mask mandate, a suggestion repeated in their reports over the past three weeks. 
Governor Kemp instead signed an executive order without a mandate, but allowing local governments to implement one if they wanted. Dr. Amber Schmidtke is a public health microbiologist and most recently taught medicine at the Mercer School of Medicine in Macon. She says it's important to also keep the numbers in context as far as how Georgia compares to the nation. You don't get to be number one in the nation for disease transmission because you have good numbers. Um, and so we should definitely celebrate our successes, but it's important to not forget the fact that we have people that are dying. On Tuesday, deaths in Georgia increased by 106, bringing the total to 5,262 deaths. People in Louisiana and Texas bracing for what could be a direct hit from Hurricane Laura. Laura is getting stronger. Some counties are already under mandatory evacuation orders. Meanwhile, the rain has been coming down for us in the metro thanks to how active it is out there in the Gulf of Mexico right now. This video coming in to us from Canton tonight from Kimberly Morris. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb joining us now with the very latest on the storm's track and what it could mean for Georgia, Chris, over the next few days. Yeah, you know, we already started feeling some of that moisture today, and that was the tropical moisture. That was kind of enhanced by Marco, and Marco is no longer a tropical system. But let me show you what we had going on. You see my phone sitting here uh, on the on the uh, holder. We've got about 300 people on Facebook Live right now. We would love for you to join us there. We're going to talk a lot more about uh, Laura and the potential impacts on us. But here you can see the rain that we had around today that was pretty persistent light rain finally has fizzled out and just pretty much just uh, faded away uh, through the evening hours tonight and you can see what we're watching uh, we have what is left of Marco still just an area of low pressure that's moving on off to the east a little bit of moisture in association with that but more moisture is going to be feeding in from Laura that is strengthening in the Gulf of Mexico and we're actually going to dry out be a little drier over the next couple of days and then we'll see some higher rain chances after Laura makes landfall and then moves to the north and turns on over to the east. I'll break all that down for you. In fact, let's take a live look out there right now and you can see what we're watching. Uh, there's that area of low pressure that is in the Gulf of Mexico right now. That is Laura. Uh, that swirl there in the middle of the uh, of the ocean, of the Gulf of Mexico and you can kind of see here what's happening there with the uh, you know the swirl around that and it's getting a little bit stronger maximum sustained winds now are at 85 miles an hour and it's going to keep moving up toward the north here's the latest that we have we have an update that came in at eight o'clock tonight winds at 85 miles an hour here's the track of the storm it's going to become a category two during the late night hours tonight and then it most likely will be a, at least a category three storm when it makes landfall late Wednesday night into Thursday this is the part we need to watch it moves north and then it takes a turn over to the east. Depending on how close that low track gets to us, we'll determine how much rain we get and if we get any wind. Stay with us. We're going to break down those potential impacts for Georgia in just a few minutes. Use the 11 Alive app to help you stay ahead of the weather. You'll find interactive maps and radar there to help you track rain and storms wherever you are. A man armed with a hammer was arrested after stealing a martyr bus this afternoon. Martyr police say the suspect used the hammer to hit the handrail, causing the driver to pull over at Joseph E. Boone Boulevard and Troy Street. The driver and passengers got out. The suspect drove the bus to the North Avenue bus loop where he was arrested. Another bus was sent to pick up the driver and passengers. Two arrests have been made in the murder of an 83 year old woman. Barbara Gibson was murdered in her Carroll County home back in May. The sheriff's office is holding a press conference tomorrow morning to release more information there. There are now four school aged children that have died with COVID-19 in our state of Georgia. The most recent is a 14 year old girl from Haversham County. She is just one of more than 100 new deaths announced today by the Department of Public Health. The county coroner says that the girl died of septic shock because of COVID-19. She did have underlying health conditions, but officials say it did not contribute to her death. And right now, there's an ongoing debate happening in homes all across Metro Atlanta. Are students safe in the classroom? Education Secretary Betsy DeVos was in Forsyth County talking about their reopening plans where parents have a choice between in-person or digital learning. Now, she's been in support of getting those students back into the classroom during this pandemic. But as 11 Alive's Latasha Gibbons reports, many people say the risks are still too high. 
Secretary DeVos was welcome with open arms to the Forsyth County School District. She even checked on a few teachers and classrooms while she was here, but she was also met with opposition from a former school nurse who insists in person learning should not be happening in Georgia right now. The Forsyth County School District sent us these video clips of Secretary Betsy DeVos's arrival. DeVos led a roundtable discussion with educators and parents. The secretary has been a major voice in support of schools having in-person learning. One option Forsyth County Schools has in place, coupled with the option for virtual coursework. While these talks were taking place in Forsyth, there were other discussions happening in other counties around the state. I really don't think she has a right to even be here, considering that she was part um, of the problem. Uh, she was in agreement with the opening of schools. A strong rebuke from Amy Westmoreland, a mother and former school nurse in Paulding County. As a nurse, do you believe it's safe to return to school right now in Georgia? No, absolutely not. Westmoreland says she resigned as a school nurse because she was concerned about student and staff safety. She even referenced these now infamous pictures of crowded hallways during the first week of school. When they decided to open schools back up, um, you know, it was just horrifying to me. And then, you know, those pictures circulated um, and it kind of confirmed my my worst fears in terms of seeing those children so close to one another. But DeVos insists the best place for students right now is in the classroom, like the one she visited at Forsyth Central High School. Thursday's COVID-19 numbers released by the Department of Health shows Forsyth County had 70 new cases today, the second highest on record. And to put that into perspective, the seven day average is about 35 cases a day. Preparations are underway for November. Georgia election officials want to avoid the headline making mess that we experienced in the June primary. This week, the state will unveil its online absentee ballot application portal. Right now, Georgia voters have to fill out paper forms to apply for absentee ballots. This will make voting by mail easier, which has become a politically charged issue this election year. 11 Alive's Doug Richards has more. A few days ago, my wife and I got in the U.S. mail a paper absentee ballot application. Filling one of these out and then returning it to the county election office has been pretty much the only way to get an actual absentee ballot in Georgia. That's going to change next week. Absentee ballots were very, very popular in the June primary, as people who voted in person sometimes found themselves waiting in uncomfortably long lines during a dangerous pandemic. To make it easier to get an absentee ballot, Georgia's Secretary of State is creating an online portal that will look something like this. You click the request button, then you enter your county, your name, and other personal info, and it takes you to a spot where you can get a ballot without signing anything. All you really need is your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your driver's license or state ID number, and your county. From those five pieces of information, the system will identify you as an individual voter and then it'll let you into the actual request section of the portal. The result is an absentee ballot mailed to you. You can drop in a box in some counties or mail in to vote in November's election. In so doing, the Republican Secretary of State is trying to sidestep a rising controversy over mail-in voting, led by the Republican president. We have to be very careful because they're trying it again with this whole 80 million mail-in ballots that they're working on and mocked by Democrats. Who is signing them? Who's signing them? What, are they signed at a kitchen table and sent in? Who's signing them? The voter has to sign them. You've got to sign your actual ballot so we know it's you actually voted. And that's the signature that election workers will try to match with the signature that they have on file when the voter registered. The Secretary of State's office will let voters track their absentee ballots online to see if they are accepted or rejected. Absentee balloting cannot begin legally until the end of September. We have been hearing from our 11 Alive viewers saying they're waiting on FedEx packages that are not arriving. The viewers tell 11 Alive their packages are going through the Norcross FedEx facility. Here's Joe Hankey. We've heard from people who've waited a few extra days, some more than a week from when they expected their package. Others are just assuming what they ordered is now lost because it has not arrived. FedEx today did confirm there are shipping delays centered around its Norcross facility, and they say it's happening as online shopping is up during the pandemic. 
This is the package David Hagen of Snellville was waiting for. He says tracking showed it came from Nashville to Atlanta and sat in Norcross for around a week. At times was listed out for delivery. Then he received a notice he had to come pick it up himself in Norcross within 10 business days. We understand there are delays. We understand that it's going to take longer. We get that. But when you can't get, you know, an honest answer, when you can't get clear communication, yeah, then it forces me to go into a store that I might not otherwise go into. During the pandemic, online shopping has been the first option, but Hagen says he is questioning shopping online if shipping is delayed. He says calls to FedEx about his package and vague online tracking updates gave him little or no information about the status of his delivery. When he arrived in person to pick it up, he waited three hours. A FedEx spokesman tells 11 Alive in the company's most recent quarter ending May 31st, FedEx ground shipping jumped 25% compared to 2019. A FedEx statement reads in part, FedEx ground is experiencing a surge of package volume due to e-commerce growth during the current pandemic that has resulted in a temporary service delay for some packages in the Norcross area. And I asked a FedEx spokeswoman if there's something unique about their Norcross facility that is creating the delays there. As the company says, shipping is up nationwide for the company. The company spokeswoman did not directly answer that question, but she did say they are increasing resources in Norcross right now to address the delays there. Straight ahead, virtual learning and separation from friends during this pandemic is not really easy for our kids. Next, how our pediatric nurse is hoping to help children cope during this tough time. And we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. That's where you can subscribe and also join the conversation in the community section. More 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Across the country are struggling to help their children understand and cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of them are in school virtually away from their friends and haven't seen their extended family. A pediatric nurse here in Atlanta saw how hard this is on kids and decided to do something about it. Caitlin Ross reports she launched Hearts Connected to try and support children during this uncertain time. Dee Dee Fritch has sat at the bedside of sick kids for years as a pediatric nurse. She saw firsthand the difference a child life specialist could have in the lives of kids who were really struggling. Now that so many children are having a hard time with the COVID-19 pandemic, she wanted to bring that service directly to the families who need it. As adults, we struggle, right? Like, I miss my friends, you know? I want to go hug people. Dee Dee Fritch knows the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on everyone, but she says it's even more difficult for kids who don't fully understand what's going on. Playing on a computer is very different than playing in a neighborhood or playing in the grass or playing with your friends. The only way some kids can see their friends now is over a screen. We've heard for so many years about screen time. You know, you limit screen time. Well, what the heck does that mean these days? She says the isolation has been confusing and difficult for kids and their caregivers. And we have parents 
grandparents, caregivers, trying to juggle. For 30 years as a pediatric nurse, she saw the benefit of child life specialists in hospitals. They helped families cope with difficult diagnoses, medical changes, or difficult life transitions. You think of a child going through a funeral service, divorce, adoption, foster care, um, imprisonment. She says that service was so essential. She wanted all families to have access to it, not just families with a child in the hospital. I've learned through my career what is some of the best ways to manage pediatric coping, but when my child is facing that, I can't say I've always done it the right way. She just launched Friday, but offers sessions with child life specialists over the phone or by video chat. She says no matter what service people use, the most important thing is that children struggling during this time are heard. Find the best way to relate to your child in a place where they feel safe and ask them open-ended questions. You can find her new company, Hearts Connected, on Facebook. And while they're based here in Atlanta, they're helping care for children all over the U.S. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Tracker. Still 350 plus people on Facebook Live right now. We're having a, a good conversation. I'm just going over some of their comments. Like Donna Evans says, I'm in Mississippi. Um, we have other folks saying here, any chances for tornadoes on Saturday with the tropical system moving to our north? And Jennifer Diane says, no chance of severe weather for us in Metro Atlanta, question mark. Well, that's what I'm gonna be breaking down for you. I wanna talk about the potential impacts as the remnants of Laura will be moving through to our north uh, late Friday and a Saturday and then exiting on Sunday. But let me first show you what we're watching right now where we have uh, that rain that's finally dying out tonight. We had that uh, good rain in our area today. Uh, some of it was heavy at times with some flash flood warnings earlier this morning, and then it just tapered off to light rain that was pretty persistent. It's now all falling apart uh, at this hour, and it is kind of connected with what's going on in the tropics. We have Marco, what's left of it falling apart. They're not issuing any more advisories on Marco. It's not a tropical system anymore, but it's still some moisture kind of generating down there at the Gulf, and then there's going to be a lot more moisture coming in when Laura moves up uh, now in the center of the Gulf of Mexico. It'll be making landfall tomorrow night and during the overnight hours. Let me show you what we're watching uh, with that storm out there right now. This is what we're what we see with the uh, swirl of clouds that you're seeing there in the Gulf of Mexico. And that is Laura. That is the hurricane and it is getting a little better organized and getting stronger too. maximum sustained winds right now are at 85 miles an hour. It's moving to the west northwest at 17 miles an hour. The pressure is also falling, which is also indicating that it is getting stronger. And we do think it'll become a category two storm uh, later on tonight overnight with 100 mile an hour winds and then continuing that intensification process, making landfall late tomorrow night into Thursday. Thursday morning most likely is a category three storm with maximum sustained winds at 115. Somebody on Facebook Live just a moment ago said, is it possible it could be a four? It could. I mean, I'm not counting that out, but the models so far are indicating most likely a three, but there have been a couple of models that say it could get even stronger than that. Then it moves inland through Louisiana, Arkansas. It takes a right hand turn and starts to move toward the east northeast here through Kentucky into Virginia, West Virginia. And it's that center of low pressure that we have to watch from Friday into Saturday as it moves to our north that we'll have more rain that'll be moving into our area. Here's a look at the hurricane warning in effect for the Texas Louisiana coast and then tropical storm warnings for the rest of the Louisiana coastline and also storm surge warnings. Many areas along the Gulf Coast could see storm surges uh, from 9 to 13 feet. That would be like a wall of water coming in with that storm. Now tonight we're drying out. Tomorrow we're going to see a pretty good coverage of clouds around, a little bit of sunshine coming through, but not as many showers, just about a 30% chance for scattered showers during the day tomorrow. And then once we go into Thursday, even drier air coming our way, and we've taken the rain chances down to 20% for your Thursday afternoon. So here's how this works all in relation with the hurricanes. So you can see the storm tomorrow going to be moving inland. We think late in the day on Wednesday. Notice uh, on Thursday, we've got the drier air here. You've got all that tropical moisture over to the west and and then drier air here in Atlanta. The storm moves up to the north and then it takes a turn moving across Kentucky into West Virginia and Virginia. And you saw there on Saturday, that's when we had the better chance for some rain that'll be moving into our area. So 30% chance for showers Wednesday. Thursday looks like the driest day with only a 20% chance for some scattered showers. And then we see Friday, the rain chance coming back up to 40% later in the day, 60% chance for showers on Saturday. 
Sunday and Monday, 30% chance, then back to 40% on Tuesday with temperatures throughout the period pretty much in the um, 80s, except for Thursday, the day when we're drier, we warm back up into the lower 90s. A middle school teacher's Black Lives Matter poster got the attention of some parents who told the district it's not an appropriate message for the classroom. We asked you to share your thoughts and everyone had a lot to say. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials. Every day on Alive at 5, we ask you to weigh in on some of the biggest stories of the day. And today, there is a story involving a teacher and a poster that people on our Facebook page can't stop talking about. Take a look. Paige McGahee is a language arts teacher at Alton C. Cruz Middle School. So she has this Black Lives Matter poster that hangs in her classroom and kids can see it during their vo virtual learning. Two families complain, saying it is divisive. It's a divisive message and it's a distraction. Those families took their concerns all the way to the district when she refused to take it down, Cheryl. We wanted to bring in Shanu Her. Shanu, you had a chance to have a conversation with this teacher and she was talking about the fact that everything she has in her classroom is about inclusion. Yeah, Paige McGahee told me yesterday that as a teacher, she's been a teacher for 20 years. It's always been very, very important for her to have uh, messages that include all of her students. Uh, it doesn't matter what their background is, where they come from. She says if a student feels like they're included, if they feel comfortable in her classroom, it will help them learn better. And so for that, she says she has all sorts of different materials and stuff in her classroom that includes people from all different backgrounds. I have um, uh, things in my room that support the LGBTQ community, students of different faiths, immigrants. True learning can't take place if students don't feel that you care about them. So you know this went all the way to the district, but their reaction, it was a little mixed. They didn't ask her to take it down, but they also were not explicitly supporting her decision to keep it up. Yeah, exactly, Aisha. Um, the district did address her and they told me that uh, they had the principal of the school actually talk to her as well and trying to come up with a way to have the poster 
in the classroom without it being a distraction. And that's what the district said. And uh, Paige McGay, he told me that again, uh, the school district did not explicitly ask her to take the poster down. So she says she's keeping it up. But the school did also say as a resident, as a citizen, Paige McGay, he still can support causes, but they do recommend not doing that in the classroom if it's gonna pose any sort of distraction like they didn't mention this poster is doing. All right, Chanu, thanks a lot. Lots of conversation happening about this. Let's get to some of those comments now. Donna starts us off saying this does not belong in the classroom, in her opinion. She says everyone matters. Try teaching that. Respect, kindness, and helping others. Time to quit the division. Nandi with a different perspective. So this lady teaches eighth graders and probably has about six class periods, so saying that there are lots of students, but because two bored moms complain, she's being asked to take it down, even though she has LGBT and religious posters up as well. All right, so Tanya says, as a black woman, I will say this is inappropriate in the classroom. I would have a different response if this were an HBCU, which is a historically black college or university, but it is a public school class. You are free to have your beliefs, but you have to be mindful of others. We have another case going on right now in the news where um, a black man was shot by police at point blank range shot in the back. And so I feel like in the students in that class who, you know, may feel some type of way after seeing that video, the video was horrific. We can't control what our students are seeing, right? Especially at that age, it may give them some sort of a feeling of peace, of comfort. And I think it also brings a conversation. We're talking about having uncomfortable conversations. If a student were to feel uncomfortable about it, let's talk about it. It's a language arts class. I think it could be a very safe space for them to further address it and take the conversation a step further if the students had complained. Mind you, we said two moms complained about this. So it would be interesting to see the mm -hmm. students' perspective on this as well and how they feel with seeing all of the representation, Cheryl, that this teacher is bringing about for kids from all walks of life. There is much more from today's episode of Alive at 5 up on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can head on over there to watch the full thing and check out some of our other videos as well. A new historical marker in coming is a reminder of the moment that started a racial cleansing of Forsyth County. Next, how one of the wealthiest counties in Georgia is coming face to face with his racist past. COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. 
Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov. Downtown Atlanta right now, a large group of demonstrators are gathered in the area to protest the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. You can see some people holding signs to take a stand against police brutality. Blake was shot multiple times in the back on Sunday in what police call a domestic situation there, but he did survive, but is paralyzed. We'll keep an eye on this story of protests in downtown Atlanta and bring you more throughout prime time and on up late at 11 on 11 Alive. A historical marker on the courthouse square and coming will soon remind people of the 1912 lynching of Rob Edwards, a black man. It was the beginning of a racial, a racial cleansing that resulted in the expulsion of more than 1,000 black residents from Forsyth County. Brendan Keefe shows you how the richest county in Georgia is now facing its racist past. It is hidden in a narrow patch of forest between rows of half million dollar homes. Even looking straight down, nothing betrays the mystery of what lies beneath. These tombstones are all that's left of the old Black Baptist Church at Stony Point. Look closely at the dates. Why do they all end before 1912? This is not evidence of promises broken, but of loved ones kept away. Because the men, women, and children buried here were the only black residents of Forsyth County, Georgia, for nearly all of the 20th century. All of the Negro people had to leave. There was knocking on the door and they were told to get out. Elon Osby heard the story directly from her own mother, Willie Mae Bagley, just a two-year-old back in 1912 when the Knight Riders came to their home and so many others in Forsyth County. Can you imagine the fear that they would have felt? William and Ida Bagley paid taxes on 60 acres they owned in 1912. We could find no record of any sale in the county courthouse except those of white men later selling parcels of the Bagley's land to one another. The 1910 census showed the Bagley's among 1,098 black residents of the county, a tenth of the total population. By 1920, nearly every last one of them was gone. There are these long stretches where decade after decade, the black population of Forsyth County is zero. Historical photos show only white faces after 1912. So what happened that year? Thousands turned out to celebrate the public hanging of two black teenagers convicted in a single day by an all-white jury of raping and murdering a white girl named May Crow. The other black suspect had already been lynched right here on the coming courthouse square. The lynching of Rob Edwards involved a very large crowd gathering outside the jail, dragging him out of the jail, beating him with crowbars, dragging his body around town behind a wagon, and then eventually his, his corpse is hoisted to, uh, you know, on a telegraph pole and everyone in the crowd takes turns shooting into his body. Time has not stopped at the cemetery where May Crow is buried next to a Confederate soldier. The headstones here continue through the 20th century, unlike the black graveyard at Stony Point. White people felt we had no value, not in life and not in death. Civil rights leader Hosea Williams and other activists marched twice in Forsyth County in January of 1987. They were met with fierce resistance, which locals blamed on outside agitators. The phrase racial cleansing is offensive to them. Shouldn't it be? I, I don't know how they can say it's offensive to them. What, what do you think it was to us? 
Back in 1912, whites also blamed outsiders as papers across the nation documented the campaign of terror that led to the expulsion of the entire black population. But we don't know how the local paper covered it because this is the only known surviving edition of the Forsyth County News from all of 1912. It features an article praising the public executions. Most of the Forsyth County News has been microfilmed, digitized, you can access it online. Mm -hmm. But 1912, all but one issue, one edition, has been erased, it's vanished. What's the importance of making sure this history isn't erased? So that it doesn't happen again. Just across from the spot where Rob Edwards was lynched, Lady Justice faces history wearing her blindfold. But soil from the square has been collected in a jar, and the name Rob Edwards will soon join the lynching memorial at the Equal Justice Initiative. The Community Remembrance Project of Forsyth County really got this rolling and worked with the Equal Justice Initiative. So they're going to put up a marker that will memorialize Rob Edwards and tell the story of, of that lynching. And that's going to be on the spot where he was lynched, which is, which is you know something I never thought I would live to see. This with the marker is a first step. There are already several hidden markers to the black community that once thrived here, now surrounded by new neighborhoods that are increasingly diverse. Some of those new residents are buying homes here on the land Elon's grandparents once owned. The old Bagley place is now among the most valuable real estate in Metro Britain Atlanta. Britain will have a more in-depth examination of the Forsyth County story as part of an 11 Alive primetime special, Equality Matters, examining social justice and racial inequ um, inequalities. That's tomorrow night at 9 on our sister station, 11 Alive. We're watching that rain fall apart out there right now, and it's still a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, though, so we could see some fog developing in some spots during the evening hours and overnight and really toward tomorrow morning. Just watching a lot of that tropical moisture still along the Gulf Coast region, you know, leftovers from Marco, which is just an area of low pressure now, not you know, classified as a tropical system anymore, but you can see some of that tropical moisture still coming in to New Orleans along the Florida Panhandle. A few scattered showers also up in the Mississippi, but things are dying out somewhat. Let me show you that tropical connection with the moisture that we're going to be having over the next few days. Now look down in the Gulf of Mexico. That swirl of orange there is very moist air. All right, see that, that orange and, and dark orange color? That's a lot of moisture there. That's what's associated with the hurricane. And we already have a lot of that moisture that was in our area today. Watch how all of that moves up toward Texas and the Louisiana coast uh, during the day tomorrow and then also into Thursday. But check this out. We're actually going to be a little drier with uh, less moisture around for Thursday. Our rain chance on Thursday is only going to be 20%. Then watch as this moves up to the north. All right, Friday's rain chances start to come back up a little bit more later in the day as the system then takes an east turn and moves over uh, into uh, West Virginia and Virginia. And on Saturday, you see those oranges that came back earlier in the day, and we're going to see higher rain chances on Saturday. And then as that moves out, some drier air tries to move in on Sunday. I think North Georgia will be dry. Uh, areas south of Atlanta will have a better chance for showers, and that's going to last into your Monday as well. So that's kind of the connection of what we have with this system and any moisture that will be moving our way. But here's more right now in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Maximum sustained winds 85 miles an hour. It's only going to get stronger and we expect landfall late tomorrow night potentially as a category three storm. We'll take another look at that track and whether or not we can see any wind out of the system as the remnants move up to our north. More than 18,000 school aged children in Georgia have now tested positive for COVID-19 since the pandemic started. While there's been a lot of talk about COVID in the classroom, Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom found staying at home also comes with risk. The CDC wanted to know more about how this virus was spreading among family members. It found that in more than half of the houses studied, multiple people got sick. That's even after the infected person slept in another room, used a different bathroom and wore a mask around the house. Now, men were more likely to spread the virus than women, but adults were more likely to give it to their children than to their spouse. 12 year old Anaya Davis says she doesn't need a study to know any of that. I felt like 
there was just pain and poking at my head. And someone was like, poke, 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 poke. If you've never had COVID, Anaya Davis says this is what it feels like. I felt like COVID was in my lungs and it hurt. And that scared me. From her head to her lungs to her stomach. She drew her emotions, you know, she felt this COVID, that the pain that she had and what she felt, she drew it. She wished for a superhero. So he's doing this type of Spider-Man pose, shooting um, hand sanitizer out onto the street. But it didn't work fast enough. The virus went from her dad to her mom. Anaya's symptoms are way worse than mine. She had every symptom, right? The no smell, no taste, the stomach ache, the chills. She had everything. And in her self-isolation came loneliness. You know, I missed my sister. I missed her a lot. It so was, this one lonely. is, are you reaching for someone? Because and the raindrops represent how, the, um, give it the sad vibe. Yeah, I was definitely reaching out. Were you ever scared? Yeah, sometimes. But a candid note from her sister did something Spider-Man couldn't. You may not be the best sister, you can be mean sometimes, but I still love you and you need to get better. And then the next day, pow, I was, I was better. A 10 day fight worth fighting, a victory over the virus. Be the boxer, keep your head up. They get punched so many times, but they keep fighting. And the person who has COVID, but the person who needs to hear this thing to keep fighting, because I know they can get through it. A Senate candidate takes to Twitter after becoming the target of hackers during a virtual town hall. A breakdown of what happened and how he's moving forward. Altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell. 
Hackers interrupting a virtual town hall meeting at the Hall County, Georgia Democratic Party last night. People in the meeting saying that Senate candidate Reverend Raphael Warnock was the target of racist attacks as hackers chanted the N-word and flashed pornographic images. Warnock tweeted about the attack saying, A hateful few won't stop us from going everywhere and speaking to everyone. It is more important than ever to hear each other out. That's what I'll do in the Senate. Now, the meetings are open to the public and advertised on the group's Facebook page and a newsletter. The group says moving forward, there will be additional security measures in place. Well, we're watching that rain that we've been dealing with in our area today finally break up. It was uh, generally light rain for the afternoon and evening. It was a little heavier earlier this morning in some spots, even so much rain that some areas had some flash flood warnings. Those have all been canceled now and the rain is pretty much ending and we're still watching a lot of this moisture that's going to be uh, moving in from the Gulf of Mexico. Thanks to Laura that is now getting closer to the Gulf Coast. That'll be making landfall uh, late tomorrow night into the overnight hours on Thursday. Take a look at what we're watching out there right now, and this is the Almanac today. We really didn't see much of a range in temperatures at all. We started off this morning at 73, and then this afternoon we got up to 76. We only had a three degree range in temperatures, and that was way below average. We should be around 87 for this time of year. And the thing that kept us cool was the cloud cover and the rain. That was pretty persistent today. We didn't get any sunshine breaking through to warm us up. And we picked up a, a little bit more than an inch of rain today, and so our surplus is really close to a foot above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So here's a look at the weather headlines. It has been a soggy day out there today. We are going to see those lower chances for rain coming up though over the next couple of days. Tomorrow we go back down to a 30% chance for showers and then on Thursday only a 20% chance for showers before the rain chances start going up again uh, for late Friday into Saturday all depending on where the remnants of Laura will go. And then also with those lower rain chances on Thursday we're going to see uh, the, the temperatures go back up into the 90s. So here's Laura right now. It is a hurricane. Maximum sustained winds at 80 miles an hour. It's going to be moving through the Gulf uh, during the day uh, or during the overnight hours during the day tomorrow and then making landfall tomorrow, late tomorrow night into overnight th early Thursday right there along the Texas and Louisiana coast. So here's the forecast track. You can see it becoming a category two storm. We think late tonight and then moving up toward the Texas and Louisiana coastline is a category three storm moving northward. It's going to be taking category hurricane force winds, category one winds into parts of Louisiana and then even into parts of southern Arkansas before it goes back down to a tropical storm and then a depression as it moves up through Kentucky, north of Tennessee and into Virginia and West Virginia. So the remnants of this system to our north on Saturday is that that will actually increase our rain chances that we're going to see a lot of this tropical moisture still feeding in. So take a look at the rainfall totals that we're going to be watching. Those totals are going to be the highest pretty much along the track of the hurricane and then that remnant low. And you can see those higher amounts here where you see like a, a lot of rain uh, through the uh, eastern parts of Texas, western parts of Louisiana. As far as we're concerned, we're in the blue color indicating a half inch to an inch and a half of rain here between now and uh, next Saturday and into Sunday. So those higher amounts will be along the track of the storm, but we'll still have some of that rain coming in. Take a look at the wind in association with this. This is what we'll be watching uh, early in the morning on Thursday, those strong winds. And, you know, you don't want to focus just on the center of the storm. This is going to be really a lot of wind here along the entire Louisiana coastline. And that's what's going to bring up that storm surge as well along the Louisiana coastline. Those winds hold together through Arkansas, and this is for Friday. And I want you to notice here, you know, we're talking 10 mile an hour winds over in Alabama. So as that system weakens and it moves on to the east, uh, we could on Saturday see 10 to 20 mile an hour winds here. It's not going to be like tropical storm force or anything like that, but just know that on Saturday with the rain, we could have some breezy conditions in our area as well. So here's the forecast for the next seven days. 89 for a high tomorrow, uh, lower rain chances with uh, about a 30% chance for showers, 20% chance on Thursday, but it gets hotter. We're going to see more sunshine on Thursday, back up to 92. 87 Friday with the rain chances increasing, especially later in the day up to 40%. Saturday is the day with the highest rain chances, some breezes possible and then back to a 30% chance Sunday and Monday. Drier air tries to come back into North Georgia, but showers will still be from Atlanta southward. And then a 40% chance for showers Tuesday with high temperatures in the 80s next week. Hello.
everyone, I'm Maria Martin. Georgia State freshman quarterback Michaela Colasurdo is sidelined for the 2020 football season after developing a heart condition related to his positive COVID-19 test back in July. Today, he's speaking out in order to warn other athletes to take this virus very seriously so that the same doesn't happen for them. You're not immune from this. This can happen to you too. Me being a 19 year old athlete, you know, a, a healthier person. I'm not someone that's had a pre existing condition. He was a state champion at Chapman High School in South Carolina. Excited for his beginning with the Panthers. <laughs> but even after finally testing negative for the virus, it was the test administered at Georgia State that alerted doctors something just wasn't right with Colasurdo's heart. That was kind of the whole scary thing is if, you know, I'm at home working out, I would have never known. His doctors have not yet pinpointed exactly what the condition is. We talked about, you know, myocarditis, which is the inflammation on the inside of the heart, pericarditis, which is kind of on the outside. The truth is we just don't 100% know what it is yet. They have, however, made a clear connection between COVID-19 and this heart condition. I've never had any heart issues or anything like that before. And when he learned he couldn't play football this year. Today I watched our team, our team practice and that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, man, I'm really, really going to miss this when, when games start coming around. He's also under strict instruction to completely limit physical activity for now, but his doctors have confidence this won't turn into a larger issue down the line. He explained it as kind of a reactionary thing. This happened because I just got sick. It can happen with different types of infections. He thinks it's going to be a relatively short term issue that should be able to be resolved. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 
Welcome back, everyone. A young basketball star is one step closer to another goal, becoming a U.S. Navy officer. We're talking about Brock Davis. He was one of the top high school basketball players in Oklahoma. He will now continue his playing career at Morehouse College while fulfilling his dream of attending an HBCU. The Navy's are I think that's just a step in the right direction. I think I'm just, it just makes me more excited to come here and just continue doing what I started in high school, just doing right by the community and serving my country. A $180,000 scholarship here, folks. He was selected from thousands of applicants around the country. Davis wants to be a Navy officer, an aviator, and his goal for basketball, well, he says we'll just have to wait and see. We continue to follow breaking news from downtown Atlanta tonight where protests against the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin have turned destructive. Even in the rain, seeing people there with umbrellas and fireworks going off, all sorts of sounds with multiple police officers out there. You see our crew on the scene. We're trying to keep them safe. Keep it right here on primetime for a live report from our crews in the field just a few minutes from now at the top of the hour as primetime gets ready to roll on at 10 and on up late at 11 on our sister station, 11 Alive. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Live news primetime on the ATL starts now. On this Tuesday night, weather to talk about. Right now, thousands ordered to evacuate as Hurricane Laura approaches the Gulf Coast. 
where the storm is now and what it could mean for us here in Georgia. And the White House Coronavirus Task Force says COVID-19 numbers are improving in Georgia, but also warn not to let your guard down. Plus, we are responding to widespread reports of FedEx delivery issues. We're hearing from the shipping company about what is going on right now. We begin in downtown Atlanta with breaking news on this night. A large group of demonstrators gathered there to protest the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Yes, another one. Hope Ford is live with the breaking developments right now. Yeah, it, it was kind of one of those situations where it, it, it started off one way and then very quickly everything kind of went sideways. Uh, there was a group uh, that met in Woodrow, Woodrow Park to, to protest here tonight. And, uh, around 8.30, that group decided to uh, start marching towards Centennial Olympic Park. And uh, so st started marching down that way. Everything was fine. And then uh, at some point in time, an arrest happened. Uh, there was a gentleman who was on a bicycle who was uh, crossing the street with the protesters. Uh, he was arrested. Uh, that seemed to cause some tension among some of the protesters because uh, some of the demonstrators uh, picked up uh, you know, things that were throwing them at buildings. We believe there's some damage off of Ted Turner. Uh, and then that's when you saw fireworks started being pop popped off. There were flashbangs, there was uh, tear gas. The group kind of went in two separate directions, circling around uh, Centennial Olympic Park and Woodruff Park at that point in time. And then uh, there was more tear gas deployed at, at one point in time, trying to break off uh, those group of demonstrators into smaller groups. There was a lot of police out here uh, in this area tonight. And then at one point, uh, they, there was uh, several small groups that were walking back towards Woodruff Park. Police uh, continued to warn them that if they even so much as stepped a foot into the roadway, they were going to be arrested. And then uh, we did see one of those instances happen where there were two uh, people who were in the roadway. Police rolled up very quickly from them just stepping into the roadway and arrested at least one person that we saw. Uh, that person did. They did pull a gun out of that person's uh, waistband, we believe. And we overheard them sit here, overheard the officer saying that they were going to be charging that man with pedestrian in the roadway, uh, but didn't say anything further uh, about uh, the gun. Uh, but they did say that he didn't appear to have a concealed carry license on him at that time. So it, it, that was in a very short amount of time that that happened, probably maybe an hour uh, that that all took place in. And then right now, uh, the, the, those protesters uh, have seemed to disperse for the night. We do know that earlier, of course, they were out here to protest. Uh, the shooting of Jacob Black, which happened in Wisconsin. Uh, he was shot seven times in the, in the back, and now the, uh, he is paralyzed from the waist down. So that's why protesters were out here originally earlier tonight and why everything uh, kind of came to a tension uh, point at that point in time where those flashbangs and fireworks went off. We're, we're not quite sure, but um, for now, everything seems to be quiet here around the Woodruff Park area. All right, Hope for thank you. Reporting live for us tonight, you see just how quickly these instances change. The video that's now behind Hope seems like a very calm scene in comparison to the video that we showed you from earlier today. Tensions boiling over from Wisconsin to Georgia and all around the country. We are seeing very similar scenes, especially in Wisconsin tonight. So in an 11 Alive poll, we asked people all across Georgia if they supported those who have peacefully protested the treatment of black Americans by police. 72% of those surveyed say that they support those who are peacefully protesting. 20% opposed and 9% were unsure. We will have a more in-depth look at topics like this in our 11 Alive primetime special, Equality Matters, Examining Social Justice and Racial Inequalities, tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. Switching to our weather now, the Gulf Coast is bracing for a major storm. Hurricane Laura is expected to make landfall as a Category 3 or even bigger by Wednesday night. That is a whopper of a storm. Hundreds of thousands of Texans are already under mandatory evacuation orders. Officials in Houston are warning of unprecedented devastation. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb tried to get all for us tonight. Chris, how about the expectation uh, as far as the storm goes here in our state? You know, we're going to have some indirect impacts from the system once it moves inland and then it curves back up to the north and east. And I'll show you that on the track. And, you know, today, 
we had some impacts from what is left of Marco with a lot of tropical moisture that was in our area giving us that rain. We had over an inch of rain today. That is all drying up right now and you can see a lot of that still tropical moisture here along the Gulf Coast region, but some of that was making it our way today. Here is Laura. This is the storm right now in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. It is getting better organized and it is getting stronger. Maximum sustained winds right now are at 85 miles an hour. That is still a category one storm. However, we do think that later on tonight and overnight it will become a category two storm with winds of about 100 miles an hour and that intensification process will continue as it goes through the Gulf of Mexico, most likely making landfall late tomorrow night, overnight into early on Thursday as a category three storm with maximum sustained winds at about 115 miles an hour. And then we have to watch as it moves to the north through Louisiana and Arkansas, then it starts to take a turn over to the east and the remnants of this system will be to our north late Friday and into Saturday. And with that, it is still going to open up the door to the Gulf of Mexico with plenty of moisture our way. So our rain chances will increase Friday night into Saturday, and we also might have some breezes, not tropical storm force winds or anything, but just some breezes here in our area on Saturday. We're going to talk more about that for you in just a little bit. The force of Hurricane Laura is expected to take out power all along the Gulf Coast. Georgia Power crews are on standby to help out where needed. Natisha Lance is live outside Georgia Power tonight. And Aisha, the call for those crews could come at any moment, either before the storm hits or after the storm hits. You just heard Chris talk about how forceful those winds are going to be. But Georgia Power says despite the pandemic, this hurricane season is business as usual for them. Georgia Power crews are ready to roll. So we have Georgia Power crews across the state ready to go to respond if and when Hurricane Laura hits the Gulf. Hundreds of workers are in standby to help Mississippi Power with recovery in the wake of the storm. We help each other out when it's needed. Mississippi Power crews jumped in to help Georgia Power back in 2017. That's when trees downed from Hurricane Irma toppled power lines. Georgia Power says it's business as usual this hurricane season, despite the need for additional pandemic precautions. Uh, it just means that there's an extra layer of safety put in. So our crews that are out in the field are practicing COVID-19 guidelines from the CDC. So that means they're practicing social distancing, even with the crews themselves. Crews are wearing PPE, mask, and using hand sanitizer to stay healthy. Most Georgia Power employees have been working remotely. Frontline workers are still on the job. The power company says customers should prepare for the storm like any other year by having an emergency kit ready to go. And Georgia Power recommends more than a dozen things to be in that kit, including canned foods, flashlights, as well as a first aid item or first aid kit in there. We are going to have a full list of those items over on 11alive.com. But in addition to that kit, they also say to sign up for their outage app, and that will give you updates on where the outages are and when repairs are going to happen in your area. Now moving to the latest on the pandemic in the Peach State, a new White House report shows improvements in Georgia's fight against COVID-19. But President Trump's federal task force says those improvements are fragile. 11 Alive's Shanu Her breaks down some key findings in the very latest analysis. The good news for Georgia is the COVID-19 numbers in the state are decreasing, including new cases and test positivity. That's according to the latest report from the White House COVID-19 task force obtained by 11 Alive News. While there are clear signs of progress, the report says these improvements need to accelerate as Georgia is still second in the country when it comes to the spread of new cases. In a new statement, Governor Kemp's office cites declines in new cases, hospitalizations and the positivity rate as proof of improvement. But the governor acknowledges there's still work to do. These are encouraging signs but we can't take our foot off the gas. The White House task force says improvements remain fragile and again calls for a statewide mask mandate, a suggestion repeated in their reports over the past three weeks. Governor Kemp instead signed an executive order without a mandate, but allowing local governments to implement one if they wanted. Dr. Amber Schmidtke is a public health microbiologist and most recently taught medicine at the Mercer School of Medicine in Macon. She says it's important to also keep the numbers in context as far as how Georgia compares to the nation. You don't get to be number one in the nation for disease transmission because you have good numbers. Um, and so we should definitely celebrate our successes, but it's important to not forget the fact that we have people that are dying. On Tuesday, deaths in Georgia increased by 106, bringing the total to 5,262 deaths. 
Today, U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos visited Forsyth Central High School. She participated in a roundtable discussion with parents and teachers about the school district's reopening plans. Secretary DeVos has been an advocate for in-person learning despite concerns about the spread of coronavirus. Forsyth County offered an option for in-person and virtual learning. The school system delayed the start of school by a week in order to give staff additional time to prepare for the combination of in-person and online learning. The pandemic still having a big impact on the economy as well. American Airlines announcing it will lay off 19,000 people beginning in October. And so that's when the federal aid requiring the airlines to keep employees comes to an end. American and other airlines have offset some of the involuntary outs and cuts by urging employees to take buyouts early retirements and also unpaid or partially paid leaves. You tonight at 10, two people have been arrested for the murder of an older woman in Carroll County. 83 year old Barbara Gibson was killed inside her home during the month of May. She was killed hours before her family planned to meet for Mother's Day. Deputies have not released the names of these murder suspects in the case, but we are expected to learn more tomorrow at a news conference. An early morning crash left three people dead. This all happened in Cobb County today. It is a traffic alert we first brought you on Morning Rush. Marietta police say a semi crashed into a car that was stopped in the center lane of I-75 near North Marietta Parkway. All three inside the car died. The driver of the tractor trailer was not hurt. It shut down the northbound lanes for hours. It's not clear why the car was stopped prior to being hit. One sought after high school athlete said no to Division I universities, decided to go to Morehouse. Why he made that big decision coming up next. So to come viewers reaching out to 11 Alive with a lot of complaints about delivery delays with FedEx. We take your questions to the shipping giant. Local staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. The second night of the RNC is underway right now. It's all in the family tonight as President Trump's daughter, Tiffany, took the stage. Tiffany Trump, President Trump's daughter. This election, I urge each and every one of you to transcend political boundaries. This is a fight for freedom versus oppression, for opportunity versus stagnation, a fight to keep America true to America. I urge you to make judgment based on results and not rhetoric. If you believe in criminal justice reform, there is only one president that passed the First Step Act, giving people a second chance, a chance at a life once again. And if you believe in expanding quality and affordable health care, only President Trump, my father, signed the right to try into law the favored nations clause and other actions to lower drug prices and keep Americans from getting ripped off. 
First Lady Melania Trump is expected to speak any moment now from the White House Rose Garden. Vice President Mike Pence and Second Lady Karen Pence will both speak tomorrow night, along with President Trump's daughter-in-law, Lara Trump. Well, it is a trend we're seeing around the country. Some gifted high school athletes passing up scholarships at Division I in institutions and then planning their academic roots at HBCUs. And that's certainly a Morehouse with its amazing tradition and amazing academics is a, a place where a young man will anchor his talent. Tulsa native Brock Davis, considered among the top high school basketball players in Oklahoma, is now a Morehouse man. I was very excited. I was very hyper. Uh, my mom actually broke down crying. She was so happy. Davis had offers at other colleges and universities, but he wanted to go to an HBCU. He says the Navy was looking for a few good young men and offered him a $180,000 ROTC scholarship. Morehouse is icing on the cake. Just like the culture that they build at Morehouse, I think that's just been a big factor. Brock will use his hardwood talents for the Morehouse Tigers now. But what about pro basketball after his Navy career? It's been done before. Basketball, we'll see how that works out. We're not playing right now, but I mean, we'll see how that goes. Davis says graduating from Morehouse, he wants to pursue that military career as a Navy aviator. Good luck to him. Well, the rain is drying up out there right now. We still have a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, and it is possible that we'll see some fog developing overnight and in the morning. But at least the rain part of this is ending after we got more than an inch of rain today. And we're still watching here along the Gulf Coast region more of this moisture around. We have what's left of Marco. It's just an area of low pressure, no longer uh, classified as a tropical system or anything. But moisture feeding in again as Laura is down to the south in the center of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and that's going to be bringing in a lot more rain and a lot more wind on the Gulf Coast during the day tomorrow. Take a look out there right now, and, and you get a good idea of what we're watching. All of that orange that you see in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, this is a look at our satellite infrared picture, and those uh, brighter colors indicate the higher cloud tops and more of the convection that we have along with this system. And it's really showing some signs here of better organization, and we do see that it's intensifying as well. As maximum sustained winds at this hour are at 85 miles an hour, we get another update in uh, before 11 o'clock, and I think that those winds are going to be even higher than 85 when that comes in. The movement is to the west northwest at about 17 miles an hour. The pressure is also falling, which means it is getting stronger. So watch the track. We do think it will become a category two storm overnight tonight and then a category three storm at or around landfall. Uh, early or uh, later in the day tomorrow, mainly late evening into overnight on Thursday, and then it moves up right along the Texas Louisiana line through Arkansas still as a tropical storm. There's going to be a lot of wind damage and a lot of rain up into Arkansas and then a depression as it moves through Kentucky into West Virginia and Virginia. Now here we are in Atlanta. We're south, <coughs> excuse me, of that track of the remnants there. But it is going to open up the Gulf of Mexico with a lot of tropical moisture, and we're going to see our rain chances increasing here for your Saturday. Now, we've got the tropical storm, uh, actually hurricane warnings in effect, and tropical storm warnings along the Gulf Coast region. The Texas and Louisiana coast is where we have those hurricane warnings. Also, storm surge warnings in effect with some storm surge in some of these spots, especially on the Louisiana coastline, is going to be 9 to 13 feet in some spots. Now, here's the center of the storm as it's going to be moving inland tomorrow. Now, I want you to see here in our area tomorrow, our rain chances are going to be lowered about 30%. And then notice on Thursday, this is early in the morning Thursday, we have that landfall. Uh, all of that tropical moisture is going to be to the west. But in the afternoon on Thursday, we only have a 20% chance for a shower. Then as it moves to the north, Friday, we're going to see our rain chances increasing late in the day. And then on Saturday, that's when the Gulf of Mexico is opened up as the low is up to our north. And we'll see our rain chances a little higher on Saturday. Some breezes too, possible at 10 to 20 miles an hour. 30% chance for rain tomorrow, and then a 20% chance Thursday. It goes up to 40% Friday. Saturday is the day with the highest rain chance and some breezy conditions possible. And then drier air tries to come in Sunday and Monday. I think Atlanta northward will be dry, and then it'll be wetter Atlanta southward. And then back to a 40% chance for shower Tuesday with high temperatures in the 80s for next week. Take a look at your weather wow moment, and this always amazes me to think of the men and women who are flying in these Hurricane Hunter planes that go into the storm uh, to gather data for us. This is as uh, this was uh, early in the morning and last night. 
when it was still a tropical storm, getting the data here from that storm. So the hurricane hunters, there are more teams in that late uh, tonight and during the day today as well. Uh, we'd love to see your weather wow moments, and we get those a lot of times from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers on Facebook. Just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member of that group. You can see what other people are posting from their community, and you can post your weather information there too. Virtual learning and separation from friends during the pandemic doesn't come easy for children. Next, how a pediatric nurse is hoping to help kids cope during this tough time. And every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. This is such a hard time to be a parent, and parents across the country are now struggling to try to help their children understand and cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been with us for a long time now. And many of them are in school virtually. They're away from their friends and their extended family. So much going on right now in those little minds of theirs. A pediatric nurse here in Atlanta saw how hard this is on kids and decided to do something about it. Caitlin Ross reports she launched Hearts Connected to try and support children during this uncertain time. Dee Dee Fritch has sat at the bedside of sick kids for years as a pediatric nurse. She saw firsthand the difference a child life specialist could have in the lives of kids who were really struggling. Now that so many children are having a hard time with the COVID-19 pandemic, she wanted to bring that service directly to the families who need it. As adults, we struggle, right? Like, I miss my friends, you know? I want to go hug people. Dee Dee Fritch knows the COVID-19 pandemic has been hard on everyone, but she says it's even more difficult for kids who don't fully understand what's going on. Playing on a computer is very different than playing in a neighborhood or playing in the grass or playing with your friends. The only way some kids can see their friends now is over a screen. We've heard for so many years about screen time. You know, you limit screen time. Well, what the heck does that mean these days? She says the isolation has been confusing and difficult for kids and their caregivers. And we have parents, grandparents, caregivers trying to juggle. For 30 years as a pediatric nurse, she saw the benefit of child life specialists in hospitals. They helped families cope with difficult diagnoses, medical changes, or difficult life transitions. You think of a child going through a funeral service, divorce, adoption, 
foster care, um, imprisonment. She says that service was so essential. She wanted all families to have access to it, not just families with a child in the hospital. I've learned through my career what is some of the best ways to manage pediatric coping. But when my child is facing that, I can't say I've always done it the right way. She just launched Friday, but offers sessions with child life specialists over the phone or by video chat. She says no matter what service people use, the most important thing is that children struggling during this time are heard. Find the best way to relate to your child in a place where they feel safe and ask them open-ended questions. You can find her new company, Hearts Connected, on Facebook. And while they're based here in Atlanta, they're helping care for children all over the U.S. Kids, adults, everyone just trying to figure it out so we can all use a little grace right now, Jeff. Absolutely. Time for me to head out to get ready for up late coming up in about 35 minutes on 11 Alive. Aisha, thank you. Here's what's coming up on the Big 36 where news is king. A new historical marker in coming is a reminder of the past. A time of racial cleansing in Forsyth County 100 years ago. Next, how one of the wealthiest counties now in Georgia is coming face to face with its horrible past, its racist past. To make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Prime Time, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. A 
historical marker on the courthouse square and coming will soon remind people of a lynching of a man named Rob Edwards in 1912, an African-American man, and it was the beginning of a racial cleansing that resulted in the expulsion of more than 1,000 African-American residents from Forsyth County. Brendan Keefe shows you how this county, which is now the richest in Georgia, is facing its racist past. <laughs> It is hidden in a narrow patch of forest between rows of half million dollar homes. Even looking straight down, nothing betrays the mystery of what lies beneath. These tombstones are all that's left of the old Black Baptist Church at Stony Point. Look closely at the dates. Why do they all end before 1912? This is not evidence of promises broken, but of loved ones kept away because the men, women, and children buried here were the only black residents of Forsyth County, Georgia for nearly all of the 20th century. All of the Negro people had to leave. There was knocking on the door and they were told to get out. Elon Osby heard the story directly from her own mother, Willie Mae Bagley, just a two-year-old back in 1912 when the Knight Riders came to their home and so many others in Forsyth County. Can you imagine the fear that they would have felt? William and Ida Bagley paid taxes on 60 acres they owned in 1912. We could find no record of any sale in the county courthouse except those of white men later selling parcels of the Bagley's land to one another. The 1910 census showed the Bagley's among 1,098 black residents of the county, a tenth of the total population. By 1920, nearly every last one of them was gone. There are these long stretches where decade after decade, the black population of Forsyth County is zero. Historical photos show only white faces after 1912. So what happened that year? Thousands turned out to celebrate the public hanging of two black teenagers convicted in a single day by an all-white jury of raping and murdering a white girl named May Crow. The other black suspect had already been lynched right here on the coming courthouse square. The lynching of Rob Edwards involved a very large crowd gathering outside the jail, dragging him out of the jail, beating him with crowbars, dragging his body around town behind a wagon, and then eventually his, his corpse is hoisted to, uh, you know, on a telegraph pole and everyone in the crowd takes turns shooting into his body. Time has not stopped at the cemetery where May Crow is buried next to a Confederate soldier. The headstones here continue through the 20th century, unlike the black graveyard at Stony Point. White people felt we had no value, not in life and not in death. Civil rights leader Hosea Williams and other activists marched twice in Forsyth County in January of 1987. They were met with fierce resistance, which locals blamed on outside agitators. The phrase racial cleansing is offensive to them. Shouldn't it be? I, I don't know how they can say it's offensive to them. What, what do you think it was to us? Back in 1912, whites also blamed outsiders as papers across the nation documented the campaign of terror that led to the expulsion of the entire black population. But we don't know how the local paper covered it because this is the only known surviving edition of the Forsyth County News from all of 1912. It features an article praising the public executions. Most of the Forsyth County News has been microfilmed, digitized, you can access it online. Mm -hmm. But 1912, all but one issue, one edition, has been erased, it's vanished. What's the importance of making sure this history isn't erased? So that it doesn't happen again. Just across from the spot where Rob Edwards was lynched, Lady Justice faces history wearing her blindfold. But soil from the square has been collected in a jar, and the name Rob Edwards will soon join the lynching memorial at the Equal Justice Initiative. The Community Remembrance Project of Forsyth County really got this rolling and worked with the Equal Justice Initiative. So they're going to put up a marker that will memorialize Rob Edwards and tell the story of, of that lynching. And that's going to be on the spot where he was lynched, which is, which is 
you know, something I never thought I would live to see. This with the marker is a first step. There are already several hidden markers to the black community that once thrived here, now surrounded by new neighborhoods that are increasingly diverse. Some of those new residents are buying homes here on the land Elon's grandparents once owned. The old Bagley place is now among the most valuable real estate in Metro Atlanta. Brendan will have a more in-depth examination of the Forsyth County story as part of an 11 Alive primetime special Equality Matters, examining social justice and racial inequalities tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, again on 11 Alive. Right now, Georgia voters have to fill out paper forms to apply for absentee ballots. This will make voting by mail easier, which has become a politically charged issue this election year. Here's 11 Alive's Doug Richards with more. A few days ago, my wife and I got in the U.S. mail a paper absentee ballot application. Filling one of these out and then returning it to the county election office has been pretty much the only way to get an actual absentee ballot in Georgia. That's going to change next week. Absentee ballots were very, very popular in the June primary, as people who voted in person sometimes found themselves waiting in uncomfortably long lines during a dangerous pandemic. To make it easier to get an absentee ballot, Georgia's Secretary of State is creating an online portal that will look something like this. You click the request button, then you enter your county, your name, and other personal info, and it takes you to a spot where you can get a ballot without signing anything. All you really need is your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your driver's license or state ID number, and your county. From those five pieces of information, the system will identify you as an individual voter and then it'll let you into the actual request section of the portal. The result is an absentee ballot mailed to you. You can drop in a box in some counties or mail in to vote in November's election. In so doing, the Republican Secretary of State is trying to sidestep a rising controversy over mail-in voting, led by the Republican president. We have to be very careful because they're trying it again with this whole 80 million mail-in ballots that they're working on and mocked by Democrats. Who is signing them? Who's signing them? What, are they signed at a kitchen table and sent in? Who's signing them? The voter has to sign them. You got to sign your actual ballot so we know it's you actually voted. And that's the signature that election workers will try to match with the signature that they have on file when the voter registered. The Secretary of State's office will let voters track their absentee ballots online to see if they are accepted or rejected. Absentee balloting cannot begin legally until the end of September. Doug Richards reporting for us tonight. If you're waiting on a FedEx delivery that is now a few days late, maybe more than a few days late, you are not alone. Several 11 Alive viewers have reached out to us with that, that familiar email that goes, help, help, complaining about delays with FedEx for packages going through the company's Norcross facility. Here's Joe Hankey, who looked into the issue today for you. My package was delayed by over a week and it only came from Nashville from Nashville to Atlanta. David Hagen received his package Friday after spending part of the day waiting and working remotely in FedEx's Norcross facility parking lot um, for about three hours on Friday until I finally was able to get somebody who could, uh, could you know, confirm that the package was there and I was able to finally get the package. Hagen's tracking updates show his package arrived in Norcross on August 15th, went out for delivery on the 18th, then back to Norcross. And he was then told Friday without his request, he had 10 business days to pick up his package. Hagen says calls to FedEx during the week led to no further details. During a pandemic, he would prefer to shop online, but is now thinking twice. Now I'm forced to go into a store that I might not otherwise go into um, because I can't count on, I can't count on shipping. I talked to the shipper and they reshipped the item and now that is lost somewhere. Abby Sand says an online purchase shipped through FedEx on July 22nd never arrived. The company shipped a replacement with FedEx on August 11th. Tracking records show her item arrived in Kennesaw on the 13th. FedEx's Norcross facility on the 14th stayed in Norcross all last week and then headed back to Kennesaw. Sands is still waiting. And she says her neighbors are too. There's a whole bunch of postings on next door, probably about a hundred of them. 
I, I know it's not just me. A FedEx spokesman tells 11 Alive in the company's most recent quarter ending May 31st, FedEx ground shipping jumped 25% compared to 2019. A FedEx statement reads in part, FedEx ground is experiencing a surge of package volume due to e-commerce growth during the current pandemic that has resulted in a temporary service delay for some packages in the Norcross area. And I asked a FedEx spokeswoman if there's something unique about their Norcross facility that is creating the delays there. As the company says, shipping is up nationwide for the company. The company spokeswoman did not directly answer that question, but she did say they are increasing resources in Norcross right now to address the delays there. Check out this circulation right now around Laura, getting a lot better defined, organized, and getting stronger. Stay with us. We'll have an update on the track of this system as it's moving up into the Gulf Coast region by this time tomorrow night. In sports, a quarterback battle brewing in Athens. What does that new offensive coordinator of the dogs think of his options under center? They are plentiful. You will hear coming up next in sports. Spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical. Speakers at the RNC last night made plenty of claims and our Verify team working to fact check each one for you, including one from Vernon Jones. Here is our Jason Puckett with a breakdown. 
Let's start with the claim from Georgia Democrat and Trump supporter Vernon Jones. The president also built the most inclusive economy ever with record low unemployment for African Americans and record high participation in the workforce. Let's start with the unemployment claim. Federal Reserve economic data does show that African American unemployment did hit an all time low of 5.4 percent in late 2019. That is the lowest in recorded history. That part of the claim is verified. But the claim that African American workforce participation is at an all time high, that part's false. The same data shows that African American workforce participation was at its highest in 1999. That was about 66 percent. And in late 2019, it was about 63%. Next, a claim from Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise. The left wants to defund the police. Joe Biden has embraced the left's insane mission to defund them. This claim is false. In an ABC interview on Sunday, Biden was asked directly if he wanted to defund the police. He answered, quote, no, I don't. Later adding that, quote, I think they need more help. They need more assistance. In June, Biden wrote an op-ed that was posted in the USA Today, where he wrote, quote, I don't support defunding police. Next, a claim from South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. We actually saw revenues to the Treasury increase after we lowered taxes in 2017. That claim is true before you account for inflation. Data from the Congressional Budget Office shows that tax revenue has increased every single year since 2009, including in 2018, after that tax cut was passed. But according to the Brookings Institute, when you apply inflation, quote, revenue fell from fiscal year 2017 to fiscal year 2018. Folks, we got more claims from night one up on our website. If you see something you want us to take a look at, send us an email. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. At any moment now, we're expecting a new update from the National Hurricane Center on the strength of Laura and maybe an updated path on Laura as well. It should be coming in any moment now. But first, this is based on what we've, we've been seeing from the last update, 85 mile an hour winds. But if you'll look at the satellite imagery here, it is getting a little more defined and more organized and it is going to be strengthening. So here's the latest that we have 85 mile an hour winds. Again, we should be getting this new update in at any time. We'll have that for you at 11 o'clock on up late, but this is the track of the storm, a category two storm overnight and then becoming a category three storm, most likely this time tomorrow night landfall late tomorrow night into early on Thursday. We think that would be right there on the Texas and Louisiana coast. I'm really going to be interested to see when this next update comes in, if that track is going to shift a little bit more to the west and if we'll see any more strengthening before it makes landfall. And then once it moves inland, it's going to be bringing hurricane force winds up through much of Louisiana, even close to the southern parts of Arkansas, then tropical storm force winds in Arkansas. And then it becomes a depression as it moves across Kentucky into west Virginia and into Virginia and then quickly up toward the north and east as an area of low pressure. This track though with this being north of Atlanta is going to really help open up the Gulf of Mexico and spread a lot of rain still into our area most likely on Saturday and the potential for some breezes too with maybe 10 to 20 mile an hour winds on Saturday but we're not talking about tropical storm force winds that are going to bring down a lot of trees and power outages or anything like that. We have the tropical storm warnings down to the south and hurricane warnings as well and then storm surge watches and warnings along the Louisiana coastline storm surge in some spots could be 9 to 13 feet like a wall of water that is going to be that high tomorrow morning. Uh, here's the storm as it's getting closer to the coastline. We think it'll be making landfall late tomorrow night. What I want you to see here, though, is that we'll have a lot of that Gulf moisture and that tropical moisture over to our west. And on uh, Thursday afternoon, we're only going to have a 20% chance for a shower here. So even with a hurricane just a few states away, we're going to be mainly dry on Thursday with only a 20% chance for rain. Then on Friday, as the system moves up toward the north and east, a little more moisture comes in late Friday. And then Saturday, as this is up to our north, is when we're going to see most of those showers around our area. And again, maybe just a few breezes around as well. But here's a look at the slightly drier air tomorrow. 30% chance for showers and then only a 20% chance Thursday, but it heats up to 92 back to the 80s for the rest of the period and those higher rain chances Saturday and then rain chances coming down Sunday and Monday. Well, it was supposed to be a big night for the Braves. Ronald Acuna and Nick Markakis were scheduled to return. Ian Anderson was to make his debut, but the rain would not go away. He would have needed an aqua lung. The game was postponed, and they will play a doubleheader tomorrow against the Yankees beginning at 4. That gives Acuna another day to rest before returning. He was dealing with pain in his wrist, and even the pressures of a 60-game season 
took time to get it right. Bueno, I just assumed that I was going to play no matter, you know, I'm going to play whether I'm feeling some discomfort or whatever until the point comes where the pain is too severe. Once that moment came, I didn't really feel any pressure to rush it or come back just because I knew that by being calm and by being patient and letting my body fully recuperate, that's how I can truly impact and help the team. So Ian Anderson will have to wait until tomorrow. Let's take a look at his rookie baseball card. We took the liberty of making 21 years old. He is from New York. Great numbers. Double, triple A last season. We'll see what he does here. He will do fine, I am sure. It's hard enough being a coach during the coronavirus period. What about being a new coach? Todd Munkin is UGA's new offensive coordinator, and he has a lot of challenges in front of him. But now that the pads are finally on, he's getting a, a good look at his starting quarterback to be. Monken said that he's closely watching all of his QBs under center ahead of Saturday's scrimmage. Jamie Newman and JT Daniels, both transfers, are the favorites to start, but Monken had good things to say about everybody in uniform right now. The one thing I would say about Jamie is that he is, he is a better thrower. Um, everybody talked about his athleticism, but he's a better thrower than people think, and I think JT's a better athlete. Obviously, Dewan last year missed part of the season like from Carson's end of it, from his throwing and his athleticism. Dewan has athleticism and his arm talent as he continues to develop, and they've been, they've been rotating like the other guys in terms of giving them an opportunity to compete for the job. Munkin spent a year in the NFL with the Cleveland Browns, but he had a really explosive offense at Oklahoma State a while back, so fans are very excited to see what exactly this season is going to be bringing. Hello, everyone. I'm Maria Martin. Georgia State freshman quarterback Michaela Colasurdo is sidelined for the 2020 football season after developing a heart condition related to his positive COVID-19 test back in July. Today, he's speaking out in order to warn other athletes to take this virus very seriously so that the same doesn't happen for them. You're not immune from this. This can happen to you, too. Me being a 19-year-old athlete, you know, a, a healthier person, I'm not someone that's had a pre-existing condition. He was a state champion at Chapman High School in South Carolina, excited for his beginning with the Panthers. <laughs> but even after finally testing negative for the virus, it was the test administered at Georgia State that alerted doctors something just wasn't right with Colasurdo's heart. That was kind of the whole scary thing is if, you know, if I'm at home working out, I would have never known. His doctors have not yet pinpointed exactly what the condition is. We talked about, you know, myocarditis, which is inflammation on the inside of the heart, pericarditis, which is kind of on the outside. The truth is we just don't 100 percent know what it is yet. They have, however, made a clear connection between COVID-19 and this heart condition. I've never had any heart issues or anything like that before. And when he learned he couldn't play football this year. Today I watched our team, our team practice, and that's when it kind of hit me. I was like, man, I'm really, really going to miss this when, when games start coming around. He's also under strict instruction to completely limit physical activity for now, but his doctors have confidence this won't turn into a larger issue down the line. He explained it as kind of a reactionary thing. This happened because I just got sick. It can happen with different types of infections. He thinks it's going to be a relatively short-term issue that should be able to be resolved. All right, that's it for sports. We'll take a break back right after this. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We're watching our rain chances tomorrow go down a little bit to 30%. It's not going to be dry all day, but drier tomorrow than it was today. And those rain chances mainly in the afternoon, highs near 89, and then even lower rain chances Thursday with highs warming up to 92. Friday, a little more tropical moisture starts to move in later in the day. Saturday is the day with the highest rain chance with highs near 87, and then back to 30% chance Sunday and Monday with highs still in the upper 80s. Chris, we'll thanks. Have, we'll have more at 11 on that new track, Jeff. You know, Chris, we worked all day and all night together, and I interrupt you in the last few seconds. <laughs> have a good night, everybody. News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands.